Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, I am Cynthia Roman, curator of prints, drawings, and paintings at the Lewis Walpole Library, for those of you who I'm meeting for the first time. Um, as we begin, I just have a few um, housekeeping and logistics to get out of the way. Um, first, the program is being recorded, um, and that's so we can post it on Yale Library's YouTube eventually. Um, captioning is available by turning on the icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and during the presentation, we ask that you remain muted, um, even with your video off, as some people's bandwidth might not do well with it. Um, and at the end, there will be time for discussion when you can either raise your hand with the reaction buttons, um, or if you prefer, you can type your question or comment in the chat, and we will monitor that. So thank you all for joining for William Hogarth's Topographies, a series of conversations. Today, we will hear from Dr. Ulrike Voskamp, all the way from Berlin, um, on dangerous sketching Hogarth at the Gate of Calais and other artists suspected of spying. Um, afterwards, Pierre von Au will moderate um, this discussion. This is the third of our online programs uh, around the Lewis Walpole Library's online exhibition, William Hogarth's Topographies, which has been curated by Pierre von Au. You think Kristen can um, perhaps put a link into the chat for the exhibition um, for those of you who may not have seen it. Um, Dr. Boskamp's new work on artists accused of spying nicely aligns with Pierre's framing of his exhibition on Hogarth's top topographical work um, in which he introduces the events of Hogarth's arrest at the gates of Calais. And we are delighted that Dr. Boskamp can join us today to bring her perspectives to this topic and incident in Hogarth's life. Um, for those of you who may have missed the first two conversations in our series, they were decolonizing Sami representations and the legacy of colonial topographies with Sami architect Jor Nango and Norwegian art historian Matthias Donbold. And uh, for the second program, the five day peregrination with Dr. Christine Riding and Professor Caroline Patey. Um, the latter program is currently posted on Yale Library's YouTube channel. And I think Kristen might also be able to put a link in the chat for that as well. So um, we start our program today with Yale's approved land acknowledgement statement, which we think seems particularly relevant for our discussions on topography. So here it is. Yale University acknowledges that indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill, Pogusset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac, and other Algonquin-speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Pierre von Au who is a PhD candidate in the history of art at Yale University. His research focuses primarily on the intersections of arts and sciences in 17th and 18th century Britain and the British Empire. His current dissertation project explores histories of linear perspective in early modern British art, architecture, and mathematics. His most recent publication is the anthology of Jean-Claude Riedenstein's writings on film which he co-edited with Enrico Camparesi, and that was published in 2021. Uh, Pierre has been a graduate research assistant at the library for two semesters, during which he has contributed his creativity and insights toward initiatives at the Lewis Walpole Library to envision and implement programs that reconsider the legacies of our 18th century British collections across the centuries and across global cultures. Um, forthcoming in spring 2024, Pierre will be editing with Marie Guadon, a special issue of the journal at Cleanse and PR. If I'm getting all these pronunciations wrong, you'll have to correct me. Um, William Hogarth and Cinema. Pierre and Marie are currently accepting submissions um, and attendants can email Pierre for more information. Um, probably put Pierre's email in the chat, which I will do in a bit. 
Um, so before I turn the program over to Pierre to introduce our guests, we want to recognize that exhibits and programs are highly collaborative efforts, and they were especially challenging when we were working in a virtual pandemic world. Um, and for this project in particular, I want to call out the Lewis Walpole Library, Susan Walker, Head of Public Services, and Kristen McDonald, Public Services Assistant. Um, thank you to both for your unfailing contributions to research, exhibitions, and programs at the library. Yes. <laughs> now over to Pia. Hi. Um, thank you, uh, Cindy, and I will extend your thanks to um, Kristen and Sue, who have been incredibly helpful throughout the process of putting this exhibition together. Um, and of course, I also want to thank uh, Nicole Boucher for supporting both the exhibition and the series of talks, as well as Ulrike Boskamp for um, taking the time to share her research with us. Um, so as Cindy has mentioned, um, this talk is organized in conjunction with the exhibition William Hogarth's Topographies, which I curated for uh, the library. Um, I took as a point of departure um, for this exhibition and event in Hogarth's biography, which is factually true, but heavily mythologized. Um, in 1748, uh, Hogarth was arrested at Calais in the north of France because he was drawing the city's gate. The French authorities suspected that he was then a spy scouting for a British invasion. He was then taken into custody um, but eventually release. As a matter of fact, Hogarth was not the first artist to be arrested there. Uh, the great architect and playwright um, uh, John Vambra was arrested there for a similar motif of espionage in 1688, but was more unfortunate than Hogarth because he stayed in prison for uh, about four and a half years. Um, but I will let Ulrike uh, tell us more about that episode. So Hogarth represented um, this event in a famous uh, painting, which was later engraved uh, and which remains one of uh, the most vivid expressions of his Francophobia. He represented himself in the background of the print, and it became one of the most popular portraits of the artist um, that was widely circulated. The reason I decided to dwell on this uh, particular episode is for mostly his symbol its symbolic dimension, the subtext being, or rather the way he and his biographers want us to interpret this anecdote, beside obviously the, the stupidity of the French authorities, is Hogarth's drawing abilities are dangerously accurate. And indeed, this idea will stick to the artist's image. Um, in 1862, William Zanby, uh, Zanby wrote uh, the first history of the Royal Academy of Arts, in which he explained that, quote, in all his graphic delineations, Hogarth drew from nature, employing no fictitious means for heightening the effect of his truthful representations. His men and women were just such as could have been seen in London streets in his time. His backgrounds were sketches of familiar haunts of people he represented, and all was real and lifelike because all natural and true, end quote. So this quote reinforces the mythology surrounding Hogarth's visual accuracy implied in the Calais episode. But was that actually the fact? This is what we wanted to explore uh, with this exhibition, and I invite you to check it online if you haven't already. So we were excited to discover afterwards that Ulrike has devoted an entire book to the study of artists suspected of spying, and we are absolutely delighted that she has accepted to present some of her research today. She will allow us to reread the anecdote of Hogarth at the Gate of Calais in a broader historical context and reconsider the symbolic and maybe maybe also the political aspects behind um, the stories of these artists who are apparently dangerously true to nature. So Ulrike Boskamp is uh, an art historian based in Berlin, Germany. Um, she currently works at the, as the head of M1, Ohen Lockstedt, a foundation for contemporary art in Northern Germany. She's one of the four organizers of the Netzwerk Topographische Bildmedien, 
an academic network dealing with topographic visual media founded in 2020. Her book, Gefährliche Bilder, uh, Zeichnerinnen und Zeichner unter Spion uh, Geverdacht, uh, came out in June 2022. It is the result of a project in the research group uh, Transcultural Negotiations in the Ambits of Art, funded by the German Research Foundation at Freie Universität Berlin. She has worked at the Freie Universität and Deutsches Forum für Kunstgeschichte in Paris. Her PhD on color in art, art literature and science in 18th century France, Primär Farben und Farbharmonie, Farbe in der französischen Naturwissenschaft, Kunstliteratur und Malerei des uh, 18. Jahrhunderts was published in 2009. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ulrike Boskamp. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. And thank you also very, very much for this very kind invitation to speak here. I will first try to, um, can you see me? Uh, can you see it? Is everything all right? Could someone please? Yeah, it's good. Okay, great. I will just dive into my presentation. William Haugar's Skate of Calais has been studied repeatedly and very thoroughly, mostly in biographical and iconographical terms. My approach in the context of Hogarth's topography is somewhat different. I have worked on spying accusations on artists from the 17th to the 20th century. In this context, the example of Hogarth is one in a long series of such accusations against artists. These, on the one hand, refer to military realities as they report occurrences on borders, near fortifications or war fronts. On the other hand, the anecdote on the confusion of artists and spy can be shown to be a topical artist anecdote, and that is what I would like to focus on in this talk. Oops. I will start with a short introduction into Hogarth's case and the gate of Calais itself. Then I will show how the motif of the print and the anecdote on Hogarth's arrest circulated in visual media and in literature. In the next step, I will show how it was introduced into two other biographies. Then I will move on to the real gate of Calais and its meaning after the widely publicized incident of Hogarth's arrest. And finally, I will open up the broader picture of the artist anecdote from its introduction in the 17th century to its iconography uh, introduced in the 19th. Let us start with the Gate of Calais. Hogarth produced this print of his own oil painting in 1749. The London Daily Advertiser announced it as representing, and I quote, a prodigy which lately appeared before the gate of Calais. End of quote. According to this, the main motif of this print is not the arrest of the artist. It is the depicted miracle, the delivery of a large beef loin from England for a British hotel in Calais, a fictitious incident with fictitious personnel. Let's look at it, but only very roughly. Um, through a wide archway, we look out onto a stage-like illuminated space closed off at the back by the mighty city gate with a drawbridge and prominently displayed English arms. In the center, a man carries the heavy roast beef, greedily watched by a corpulent French monk, two skinny French guards on the right and left, and an equally thin Irishman. To the other direction, a soup maigre, a meager soup, is carried off to feed the French on the right-hand side. In the archway in the front, three market women squat with their wares, amused by the face of a fish. On the other side, a beggar is recognizable as an exiled Scotsman. Hogarth has hidden his half-figure self-portrait in the middle ground. Equipped with a drawing pad and a pencil, he looks out of the picture in profile. 
His arrest is indicated only by the fact that a hand is placed on his shoulder and the pike of a halberd looms above his head. The French soldier remains invisible. Art historic research has concentrated on the binary opposition between the British and the French that is visually displayed, the strong anti-French thrust of the image and of Hogarth himself. Let me summarize the event of Hogarth's arrest as it appears from art historical research and from the four roughly contemporary sources, including a text by the artist himself. In August 1748, Hogarth and four other artists had set out on a journey to Paris. Such travel had just become possible again following the armistice between England and France after the war of the Austrian succession. Hogarth seems to have been a difficult craft travel companion who openly displayed his dislike of everything French during his journey. On the way back to London, he was arrested as a spy in Calais from where the ferries crossed to England. The reason was that he was found drawing a city gate which formed part of the city's fortifications. The drawing that triggered this suspicion is unknown. The artist was put under arrest in his hotel room and accompanied onto the ferry by the French soldiers. Immediately after his return to England, Hogarth produced his oil painting, The Gate of Calais, which was shortly afterwards published in a reproduction print. So much for the raw facts. In Hogarth's own version of the incident in his drafts for the analysis of beauty, his description of his arrest sounds as harmless as his print looks. And I quote, soldiers are ragged and lean. I was seized by one of them as I was centering about and observing them and the gate, which it seems was built by the English when the place was in our possession." End of quote. According to Hogarth, he was released because his drawings could easily be identified as artistic works. According to Horace Walpole, Hogarth had needed to prove that he was an artist by drawing caricatures for the French, an ability that a military engineer was not believed to have. All contemporary authors, except the artist himself, refer to the actual danger as attached to spying accusations for sketching of military geographies in times of political unrest. They also report that the artist was mistreated by French guards. John Nichols noted in his biographical anecdotes of William Hogarth in 1781, and I quote, for though the inno innocence of his design was rendered perfectly apparent on the testimony of other sketches he had about him, which were by no means such as could serve the purpose of an engineer, he was told by the commandant that had not the piece been actually signed, he should have been obliged to have hung him up immediately on the ramparts. Hogarth has, had thus avoided the death penalty, but he preferred to omit the, omit the memory of this, these uncomfortable sides of the incident and turned his anger into art. The circulation of the motif in images and in texts. The anecdote about Hogarth's arrest in Calais circulated widely and above all through the print. This became a great success and also very rapidly became part of Britain's popular visual culture. As the motif is not self-explanatory, the story needed to be retold with each reuse and reprint. To Hogarth's distress, pirated copies were produced and sold by other printers. The print was also very soon sent to China, where in the 1750s, the motif was painted onto punch bowls and large mounted vases for British clients. Also individual motifs were isolated and used for different purposes. The starving French soldiers seem to have been used individually and juxtaposed with images of well-fed British soldiers in advertisements for recruiting in Britain. Hogarth's self-portrait as a draftsman in profile was re reused in a variety of contexts, not only as a portrait 
uh, of the artist himself, but also to decorate business cards and shop signs of very different professionals from printers to tailors. Jenny Oglo comments this with the suspicion that the anti-French sentiment somewhat remained active in these reuses. And I quote, Hogarth, Hogarth as an artist spy was the Englishman's hero. But it was not only through the pictorial motif that the anecdote of Hogarth's arrest circulated. It was also taken up in contemporary literature. Shortly after the publication of the print, Tobias Smollett inserted the anecdote into his novel Peregrine Pickle, published in 1751. His fictional traveling artist, Lehman Pallet, also a Francophobe, has convincingly been interpreted as a caricature of Hogarth by Ronald Paulson. Another adoption is contained in another contemporary novel, the first volume of John Kijel's delirious work, The Card of 1755. Its main character, the British clergyman, Dr. Elwes, is arrested in Montreuil on his journey from London to Paris while drawing a dilapidated fortress. And I quote, the doctor sallied forth to survey the fortifications of the place, which although irregular and in ruins were sufficiently beautiful to employ his leisure and attract his curiosity, being fond of architecture and not without some elegance of taste as he imagined. He proposed to take a draft of the citadel and for that purpose placed himself in a convenient situation, meditating the great design. He had not executed even the minutest part of it when he was surrounded to his inconceivable surprise by four men presenting firearms and bawling out to him as they approached, one in form of speech, uh, one in one form of speech and another in another, but all with military fierceness and in a language incomprehensible. End of quote. This juxtaposition of artistic and military views of a landscape that the text introduces with some irony is typical for this artist's anecdote, as well as the complete immersion of the artist into the view and his work and also the language problem. I would now like to present two examples in which the Hogarth anecdote became relevant for nonfiction. It was inserted into the historic biography of the architect John Vanborough in the 18th century, probably, and it was appropriated by the artist Sophus Matson in the early 20th. In the Hogarth literature, the parallel between his arrest and that of the British architect John Vanborough, who lived from 1664 to 1726, and this arrest took place in 1688, also in Calais and also for drawing, has regularly been noted with some surprise. However, as early as 1977, Vanborough scholar Kerry Downs noted that the architect had originally not at all been arrested for spying and drawing, but for a derogatory remark about the governor of the Netherlands, William III of Orange Nassau. He also put forward the thesis that Vanborough's biography was retrospectively aligned with that of William Hogarth. The anecdote on Vanborough as appears for the first time in 1753 in Vanborough's biography in the lives of the poets by Theophilus Sibber, a friend of Hogarth, who was also in the famous society of beefsteaks. Um, in this case, should it be true, the insertion of the artist's anecdote into Vanborough's biography led to it being smoothed over in retrospect and above all depoliticized. His arrest is reinterpreted as a typical compo component of an artist's vita. Much later, we find the anecdote on Hogarth visually referred to in another artist's biography, that of the Norwegian sculptor Sophus Madsen. In November, who lived 1881 to 1977, in November 1911, the British art magazine Sketch published a short, lavishly illustrated article titled 
drawn in a prison with used matches, sketches and sculptures by Sophus Madsen, who was arrested as a spy. It reported that Madsen had been traveling in the Kronoge mountains around the German Bohemian border with a friend. Because of their drawing, they were arrested as spies and thrown into prison. Deprived of their art utensils, they used burnt matches to draw. The magazine printed two of Madsen's sketches allegedly made in prison. In one of them, the one at the bottom left here, um, Madsen shows himself and his friend sitting in the dark cell. He presents himself as a prototypical artist with a 17th century beret on his head and a Rubens type beard. Both clearly refers to the over historical status of artist and art. In the second drawing on top, the gate of Cal Calais is actually quoted by inserting an image of three market women at the same place as in the gate of Calais at the bottom left. So in this case, the young sculptor's self stylization as an artist in the following of Hogarth through the anecdote of the confusion of artist and spy can clearly be shown. The status that Madsen asserts in his drawings is underlined by the magazine sketch. It shows three marble sculptors, sculptures by him dramatically presented as masterpieces in professional photographs. Hogarth's Gate, Topography and Reenactment. The Gate of Calais did exist. Felix Packnadel identified it as the Port du Havre, built in 1625, after the British had left, and so it never carried the weapons that Hogarth showed. It was located at the end of today's Rue du Havre, and when looking at Hogarth's print, the viewer looks onto the Place d'Armes in the center of Calais from the harbor. In the 18th and 19th century, the Port du Havre served as the entrance to the city for foreign travelers coming from the ferries. It was also an important element of the town's fortifications against invasions by sea, as the drawbridge could separate the town from the harbor area. A great interest in the correct identification and, no, this was wrong. A great interest in the correct identification and location of the Gate of Calais arose with Hogarth's growing fame in the second half of the 18th century. I will give you two examples. Sylvanus Urban, editor of the Gentleman's Magazine, reported from Calais in 1789, and I quote, I have seen all the gates at Calais, but none of them correspond exactly in total with Hogarth's print, where he made use of a pictorial license. From apparent circumstances, he meant to represent the Port du Quai as the noble sirloin just landed from the, on board the English packet plainly indicates. End of quote. He was right, as the Port du Quai, Port du Quai was another, other, another name for the Port du Havre. Another British author in 1816 seems to have had no problem recognizing the gate, and I quote, passing through Hogarth's famed gate, I could not but observe the strict similarity it bears to his drawing. Though I missed the meager French soldier in the old costume who stands so conspicuous a figure in the foreground of that print, his place being now supplied by the Garde Nationale, as squalid and awkward as he was sleek and spruce." End of quote. There were frequent errors in the identification of the gate. In 1825, the demolition of Hogarth's gate due to an enlargement of the harbor was sad sadly reported, but the Port du Havre is still standing in later photographs, as you can see here. Artists had a special way of dealing with Hogarth's gate and the anecdote connected to it. Not only did British draftsmen in the 18th and 19th centuries immediately associate with it with Hogarth when they were themselves suspected of spying. 
Many artists placed themselves in Hogarth's succession by drawing the Porte du Havre on their own journey. We find such a drawing of the front of the Porte du Havre as well as the side with the chain of the drawbridge in William Turner's sketchbook of 1824. Only a little earlier in 1816, the British artist, David Wilkie, a great fan of Hogarth, had sought out the exact place where Hogarth had been arrested and reported what happened to him in a letter to the engraver Abraham Reinbach. And I quote, on traveling to France, uh, through France, the most singular occurrence was that of my being arrested at Calais in the act of completing a sketch of the celebrated Gate of Hogarth. As I had first obtained leave from the officer on guard, I expected no sort of interruption." End of quote. Wilkie seems to have been criticized for his behavior as Reimbach reports later in his memoirs, and I quote from those, the observation was made in England that Wilkie, from a wish to reenact the Hogarth drama, had put himself in the situation expressly that he might be arrested, but nothing could be further from the general tenor of his conduct, distinguished as it had always been by unobtrusive manners and a simple unaffected modesty. And in the present case, most assuredly, the remark had no foundation whatever. End of quote. In John Coney's volume, Beauties of Continental Architecture, published in London in 1843, the illustration entitled Hogarth's Gateway, here on the left, shows a completely different gate, the Porte de la Mer, but includes the explanation, and I quote, which the notice of English travelers has been particularly attracted um, to since the publication of Hogarth's celebrated print of the roast beef of old England. And the English Irish draftsman Percy Hetherington Fitzgerald recounts his own experience at the gate of Calais in his travelogue of 1887. He had a nightly vision of Hogarth drawing the market women and included his drawing of Hogarth's gate as an illustration here in the middle. And a year later, the London-based American draftsman Joseph Pennell showed himself equally obsessed with Hogarth's gate, as his wife, Elizabeth Robbins Pennell, describes. And I quote, As everyone who has passed in the Paris train knows, at the entrance of the town is the town gate, a heavy grey pile with high gabled roof and drawbridge, the chains of which hanged on either side of the archway. Jay declared that it interested him more than anything else in Calais since Hogarth had painted it, and he began an elaborate study. I have rarely seen him more conscientious over a sketch. Indeed, he was so pleased with this gate that later, when at the end of the street we found another, under a tall turreted house and leading into a large courtyard, nothing would do but he must have that as well. In a word, he was in a mood to draw as many gates as he could find." End of quote. Pennell drew all the city gates he encountered in Calais, but back in London came to the conclusion that he had not found the right one. Two gates illustrate the travelogue, and in retrospect, it can be stated that although Pennell did not recognize the Porte du Havre, he did draw it. So for the British, the Porte du Havre had acquired a special meaning as Hogarth's gate. Not only did it become a place of pilgrimage for British artists, the gate itself, as the inconvenient point of access to the European continent, and the site of border crossing from England to France was superimposed with the artist anecdote. As the place where the greatest British artist had been arrested in a paradigmatic Franco-British confrontation, it had become the memorial of military conflict, of rival rivalry and mistrust between the two states. The confusion of artist inspires topical artist anecdote. In the context of British art history, 
The arrest of Hogarth is usually perceived as a unique event, but it must be said that it is not unique at all. I have found around 240 cases of accusations of spying against artists who were drawing on the spot in Western Europe between the 16th and the 20th centuries. Most of these art anecdotes are transmitted in art literature, artists' biographies or collections of anecdotes. The astonishing fact is that these anecdotes are almost completely identical, even though they appear in different artists' lives, different contexts and epochs. Ernst Kries and Otto Kurz have famously investigated such topical artist anecdotes in 1934, and Catherine Suslop greatly expanded this in her book, The Absolute Artist, Historiography of a Concept in 1997. She explains how topical artist anecdotes as mobile chunks get inserted into different artists' lives in order to identify a person as an artist and to constitute, constitute and historically continue the mythical figure of the artist. Through such anecdotes, genealogies of artists are constructed who can claim the same anecdote in their biographies. As a topical artist anecdote in this sense, the narrative about the artist accused of spying is found in art literature from the late 17th century onwards. In its, its first full version in Filippo Baldinucci's collection of artists' lives of 1688 relates a case that happened to the Florentine artist Andrea Boscoli when traveling abroad in the Marks around 1600. Unfortunately, this anecdote is too long for quoting here, but I would like to recount the characteristics of it as I found them reappearing very regularly. So in its full version, it includes five elements. First, a male artist travels through a foreign country, mostly he is near a border. Second, he depicts a beautiful or interesting landscape and is immersed in its beauty and in his work. Third, a local person or a simple soldier or a policeman see him and suspect that he is a spy for the neighboring country and that his drawing is made for a military purpose, i.e. an invasion. His identity is at stake as well as that of his artwork. A negotiation begins about whether he is a spy or an artist, his drawing artwork or military drawing and the landscape conceived as a beautiful sight or a military terrain. In this phase, communication problems between different languages often arise. Fourth, the artist is arrested and brought to a higher ranking officer who is more civil than his first accusers. The drawings are examined. Mostly that does not help. Fifth, his identity as an artist is proven through luck or a coincidence or through a message from a capital, an art academy or school or an embassy. He is finally freed. So from the perspective of the artist anecdote about the confusion of artist and spy, it must be concluded that the anecdote on Hogarth, unique as it seems, also places him in a row with other artists before him, as for example, the Dutch, Dutch artists Martin Reichert and Adrian Brauer, and many landscape artists afterwards, especially those in search of the picturesque around 1800, very prominently, for example, George Moorland. And finally, I would like to briefly show you how the anecdote on the confusion of artist and spy acquired an iconography. Before this happened, the arrest of William Hogarth became a pictorial motif. The Victorian artist William Powell Frith, another great fan of Hogarth's, had received a commission for Hogarth brought before the governor of Calais as a spy in 1850. The work was exhibited at the Royal Academy a year later, later and in 1860, a reproduction print by Will, William Camden Edwards was published. Hogarth is here dressed in fashionable 18th century clothes and accompanied by his pug, leaning on a barrier. Two French guards on his right and left are clearly reminiscent of the starving soldiers in the gate of Calais. 
The British artist and the French governor opposite of him seem to be sizing themselves up or each other in an omnipresence of sheets of drawing that will obviously be used for the decision that is following. Only very little later, an extremely prominent case of a draftsman suspected of spying was widely publicized, which occupied British politics up to the prime minister for months. In 1852, the British architect Harry Robert Newton was arrested in Verona, which was occupied by Austria at the time. Inspired this by this case, um, the artist Richard Doyle inserted it into his comic travelogue, The Foreign Tour of Messrs. Brown, Jones and Robinson. Here, the traveling artist is shown meditating and painting the view of Verona, while from behind, Austrian soldiers come to arrest him. This pictorial formula was used and reused, as I will show in a moment. Doyle tells the whole of the story of the artist's anecdote in nine consecutive images. Here the arrest, here the artist and his travel companions are led away by the Austrian soldiers and you can see the sketches of found upon him at the bottom. For the picture of the confrontation of artist and commander here on the left, uh, Frith's composition was reused by Doyle. Thus, visually, the memory of Hogarth himself is still present in this series. But it was Doyle's other scene that I showed you first that became the somewhat official iconography for the artist anecdote. I will show you only a few examples of its reuse. It was taken up, for example, during the Franco-Prussian War, here again in the Punch magazine in 1870. The Austrian artist Anton Greil made two watercolors with this motif also in the 1870s. And you can see the characteristic othering that happens in the anecdote and also in the images here between the city and the country. The Viennese artist from the city, an elegant artist being um, recognized as different and therefore identified as a spy in this image. And it was again taken up in the spy mania in Britain before and during the First World War. James Fox has worked on these images. It found a very late reissue in the Russian magazine Crocodile during the Cold War, when the British politics decided to let Americans build military bases in Britain. And this is criticized in this image where you can see an American soldier in Britain arresting a British artist. To sum up, the anecdote on William Hogarth accused as a spy can be shown to carry all the characteristics of a typical topical artist anecdote that circulates through different media. In the British context, the anecdote of the artist suspected of spying was clearly identified as originating with Hogarth and the Gate of Calais stood for this. This led to the real Gate of Calais being perceived as a memorial for the confrontation between Britain and France. While the anecdote of an artist suspected of being a spy adds flavor and heritage to his biography, it does also evoke the multiple uses of visual representations of landscape for artistic or military purposes, as such as it points to a characteristic intersection between artistic and military spheres that my book is about. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Ulrike. That was extremely dense and uh, I know. very rich information. That was absolutely terrific. Um, if any one of you has any question, you can either use the 
raising hand function or type it um, in the chat. Um, if no one has, like, do, while people are collecting their thoughts, I was, I wanted to ask you something about the very fact that those anecdotes happen to artists and does it like based on your research um especially like from such a large chronological scope would you say that it also emphasizes the fact that artists more than anyone else uh were also able to cross borders um in a certain sense or like it emphasized their ability to travel in a way um which might have been like the reason behind the like the suspicion against them i mean artists being used as diplomats etc cetera, etc cetera. so do you think it, there is any link between that and and these these anecdotes i don't see why artists would be traveling more easily than other british people i mean in the time in the 18th century but what I do think is that this anecdote um, captures a, a problem that is very specific to an artist traveling. And that is a, a very, it's the kind of othering that sets in when one is drawing in a landscape that is not one's own. That of course is, is specific for the artist's travel side of this anecdote, but I wouldn't say, I'm not sure, maybe I didn't understand what you mean, but I wouldn't say that artists travel generally more easily. I mean, it's generally something that we tend to forget the mobility of artists due to national art histories. I can see that. And we should uh, sort of get that back um, into our minds very regularly, especially as those artists who get forgotten are usually the ones who don't easily insert international art histories, but yeah. That is a really good point. Um, Noel Gallagher, um, do you wanna unmute yourself? Hi, um, thank you so much for that. That was a really fascinating paper and I was really interested by your account of the kind of art historical afterlife of the image. And I, I guess to me, so I'm not an art historian, um, I kept thinking about the title, which of course is also an allusion to fielding, right? And there's this whole idea that, that Hogarth is naming it after this focus on food and the contrast between the French soup maigre and the roast beef of old England. And it was striking to me how in the afterlife that resonance seems to be gone so i just wanted to know whether you wanted to kind of comment on that at all and why why you think that happens all i can say to that i don't know why that reference is gone but um in the artist anecdote that is sort of shaped in each you can show how it shapes um with time something happens it is told it is retold and after a while it gets the full it gets the full shape of an artist's anecdote and food is not part of this anecdote so sort of local detail seems to um, disappear from uh, from these anecdotes when when they somehow uh, come to their final form that's i think all i can say because the the real topic is this confrontation, this triple confrontation or this triple decision that is being made between artist and military and the uh, artistic image and, and military image and um, artistic landscape, so to speak, and military landscape. Um, maybe Bethany, if you want to unmute yourself next. Oh. Bethany, Sorry, I think we you cannot now. hear you.
Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, great. My computer broke last week, so we're still understanding how to work together again. Um, it's exciting. Uh, this was really cool. Thanks for the talk. And I, so what you got me thinking about was how like artistic motifs, like visual motifs, right? Hogarth repeats motifs like it's going out of style. Um, and this narrative function of the anecdote as part of an artist's life. So like, I was really struck by the parallel I saw there in terms of how like, to show that you're a real artist, you like get caught as a spy. That's part of your artistic journey. Like you sketch as a young person or whatever. Like, I don't know the artist's narrative storyline the way you do, but I was wondering about that, um, the ways that those kinds of narratives repeat. And like, you said that you found this kind of narrative in a bunch of different artist stories. I'm wondering um, if other people or you have thought about, like have seen that it's like a set piece, right? Like, um, cause there's also that for like literary people too, right? Like there, I mean, literary figures, Afro Ben gets us, you know, as a spy, like there are lots of Defoe, like lots of other literary humans are spies too. Everyone's a spy apparently. Um, and so I just wondered about this, like, there's something about that connection I found really fascinating and wondered if you could just talk more about it. Um, but also maybe connected, because again, lots of thoughts, is um, how do you prove a negative almost? Like, how do you prove you're not a spy? Like, because you can be like, I'm not a spy. And they're like, but draw a thing or like do whatever. Like, yes, yeah, Soren, I'm just, I'm just enacting my role in these things right now. Thank you. Um, like, like, you can't, like, it's really hard to prove that you're not a spy because uh, everything you you do, right? Like, so yeah, just, uh, yes, that, that's what my question was. Yeah. Great question, thank you. That's exactly, I mean, I I wasn't expecting to find, I found these repetitions and was surprised. And then I found the work of Catherine Susloff and was very happy because um, she explained just that. And it, it comes, it is a tradition that comes out of uh, Christian um, lives of holy, oh God, my saints. You know, this, um, uh, this chunk business that you can take something out of a life and make someone, identify someone through an anecdote. And um, the traditional anecdotes are anecdotes that are about the youth, and the age, old age of painters normally, and who in their youth are found uh, drawing perfect circles and as shepherds and then found by the great Chimabue and so on. So that's exactly the, the, the thing that is done. It is entered into a life and then you identify. Um, the anecdote I found, and that is a problem, is, is not, does not really, uh, qualify to make an artist to to oh god my English to make an art to heighten an artist to make him more important but what I think is that it amongst others has the use of making him more male because he is being um, believed to be a military a, a mighty person who is preparing an invasion um, so that is one of the suspicions that I have. I don't, you cannot prove you are not a spy. And that is the wonderful thing about these stories, because even if you, um, if your image is completely innocent, there is no way of proving it is innocent. You're absolutely right. So what gets told, and it also gets told in a late version of um, the Hogarth uh, anecdote is that the series of drawings that the artists usually have in their hotel or their rooms are inspected. And through the series, then they try to find whether these images are that, those of a spy, but generally you cannot find it out. And that is why proof is normally um, proof of identity and not through the image. So you need proof of identity from the country, from the embassy, from the art academy, or it is not the image that 
uh, gets the artists freed normally in these anecdotes and I think also in reality. Yeah, uh, as someone who's been accused of being a spy a lot, like literally in my life, like I totally oh. understand this, like you can't prove a negative. Yeah, like, prove a negative. If, yeah, you just can't. You're like, I'm not a spy. And they're like, that's what you say yeah. if you were a spy. And you're like, yeah. but really, um, yeah, what you're saying, I was, it's just, sorry, I just want to like, Cindy, is that okay if I like ask another follow-up? Because I know you have your hand up, Cindy. So I don't want to like jump in. Okay. Uh, so uh, I had heard, um, that maybe it's a later 18th century, but like spying is seen actually as not masculine because it is like a dishonorable profession because you're lying all the time. Um, or like, you're not like manly enough to go like fight with swords, but like I've, you've done more in this than I have. So that is, I'm super interested in that idea of gender construction also with spyness. I have read that too. Um, female spies sort of come up more clearly in the very late 18th century and in the 19th century, um, who actually as females spy, but that's the question you are, uh, you are talking about. The, um, the fact that a male soldier does not wear the uniform and show himself as, um, there is a book by Alain de Verbe on, on, on spying, and it's called L'Espion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's exactly his argument that when the espion does not, um, does not show himself openly in a uniform, then um, there is a sort of um, de um, maleizing <laughs> in this figure. And that seems to be part of it, yes. But my artists that I found, they all came out of it free. They are not spies. And they and I have found a couple of texts where they ironically refer to their pencils or their brushes as weapons. They love it. They love their the their spying allegations against them. And they love to, to be thought of as wearing uh, the weapons. That's all I can say. I mm, um, <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Cindy. Uh. Oh, sorry, I'm having a hard time with my buttons too. Um, so I'm wondering, following up on Daphne's question about you cannot prove that you're not a spy, but can you somehow in these anecdotes prove that you are an artist because you're not a spy? Um, and then the, so there's that disambiguation which, between someone who draws accuracy and detail in someone who is more um, a genius or an artist or inventive. And then I'm also wondering how that intersects with what I see, maybe just because I want to, um, is the overlapping of artists in these anecdotes and caricature or satire. And I, I, I was really struck in your talk in, in this context about how Horace Walpole said that um, records that Hogarth proved he was not a spy because he did caricature, which for lots of us who study art history know that there's that um, distinction between being an artist and being a caricature or satiric artist. So anyway, it's not all that well formed, but they're just, it's, it's such a complicated topic. I think I, I have a problem answering that precisely, but the caricature anecdote, um, for me, that was important because I, I thought it was exactly the other way around. Um, I'm not sure about high and low in the 18th century. Well, probably there you know much more, um, but I thought that it was um, the, depiction of human emotion that is uh, that is uh, the 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 area in which artists excel when they are good artists and that can either be uh, that can be shown in history painting but also in caricature but but also there is another architect anecdote on an earlier um Dutch artist uh, who also freed himself through caricature, 
So, and I don't remember who it was. I think it may have been Adrian Brauer. Um, it is in my book, but I forgot who it was. <laughs> um, sorry. So th this also is a sort of string. It's a, it's another thread of taking up um, um, of taking up motifs in the telling of the story. And I think both Ho uh, Walpole and Hogarth were well read enough to be reproducing partly at least artist anecdotes that they may have known or come across. Um, your other question about the um, um, about landscape artists being precise or not precise or geniuses, uh, I mean, uh, um, representing landscape more or less precisely. I am not sure because um, the argument regularly when people get when artists get caught as spies, they um, it is it is suspected that they pose as artists. So no matter what their drawing looks like, anything could be hidden in it. Any you know a, a representation of a dangerous landscape, whatever, or a, 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 a landscape that could be invaded, could could in, in any time and this especially in the 19th century, this was apparently both used and also suspected that, that, um, that spies actually posed as artists and into artistic imagery introduced secret signs. I didn't find a single drawing with a secret sign in it, but I did find a few military people who claimed that they had done it exactly that way, one of them uh, being the, um, oh, the paradigmatic Boy Scout, who, um, Baden Powell, who, uh, who showed how he did it. He prepared, he said he prepared sketchbooks with butterflies in it, and he left one page free. So into this prepared sketchbook, he would draw a new butterfly. And in this butterfly, he would uh, insert um, the image of a fortress of the, you know, the, the plan of a fortress. So that when you look through this sketchbook, you would not find which of these drawings is significant. And in a similar way, other people said that they were producing images that posed as art, but that contained certain signs that would um, transmit the important information in these pictures. <sighs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> for these very generous answers. I just want to draw attention to two comments. So Catherine Zeiler says that artisan Image makers like old craftsmen did travel across the continent, if not Britain, relatively easily because of the infrastructure of craftsmen's network, like compagnonage in France. There were always anxieties around their mobility, though to do um, with spreading disease, non-guild related work, etc. So later on, they got passports, but at the time, um, that was a highly mobile uh, class. And then I see that uh, Jacqueline uh, writing has been uh, um, writing a few comments. Jacqueline, do you wanna do you wanna say something out loud, or do you want me to read them instead? That... Uh, you can read them if you like. <laughs> yeah. no, they were just you, little you comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm ha I'm happy to to just observe that the. Um... Uh, that the in, in addition to this idea of being arrested as a spy, and that, and I think that's to do with being in civilian dress. I think you, Ulrika, you you mentioned that that if you were dressed in military kit, you wouldn't be arrested as a spy as such. You are arrested as a mi fellow military man, you know, going about your business as it were. Um, but a a civilian, somebody dressed in civilian, could be summarily executed. I mean, there wouldn't be a trial. You would simply be executed. Hence. The anecdote about the governor saying he would have simply have hung him straight, you know, hanged him straight from the uh, 
from the um, the gate itself, and he would have been within his rights to do so, even within international, as it were, recognised um, protocol, um, military and non-military protocol. Um, and then the other thing I just observed is that, that this whole thing about uh, being arrested as a spy, there's also another um, well-known sort of trope within artists of being strapped to masts in order to experience storms and create marine paintings. And I just observed that JMW Turner famously said he was strapped to a mast in order to experience a storm and then painted snowstorm steamboat over harbour's mouth. But actually there was an earlier anecdote of um, Claude Joseph Vernet doing exactly the same thing. And, um, and this was painted by his, his son as a, a tableau um, of the event um, was sort of memorialized by his son. So there are other examples of these tropes and it's, it's partly about being male, it's also about being almost like an extreme sportsman, you know, being an artist that goes to any lengths to experience something in order to then replicate it, get the emotional as well as the visual impact of a storm um, uh, in order to, to achieve the, the sort of um, the, the, the um, correctness of it, both as a physical thing, but also as an emotional experience. And of course, if you're talking about somebody like Turner much later than Hogarth, you're talking about sublime. And you're talking about that terror, the idea of nature as terror. Um, and that's that's uh, what he's, that's the trope he's, he's playing with. Um, anyway, just a few observations. Well, I think if I could quickly answer, I think the, the important thing is what you call trope is apparently exactly the same that I would have called anecdote, but um, it is about, um, it is about in acting, it is about acting out how to be, and it's a habitus question, I would say. It's about how to act in order to act as an artist. And I think that is the whole, uh, that is part of the point anyway of this anecdote and of such recurring anecdotes that that create such genealogy, genealogies. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, is there any last question or comment for Ulrike? Well, I see that we are already 11 past um, six or one. I mean, for me, it's six. <laughs> um, so thank you everyone um, for coming, for attending. Thank you so much Ulrike for such a rich presentation. Um, I think it would add um, a lot to uh, the online exhibition. And um, yeah, thank you, Cindy, and thank you, everyone at the Lewis Wapo Library. And uh, see you maybe next time. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ulrika. It was really terrific. NPL, thank you. <laughs>